Damas and Aaron, welcome to Island Voices. Please hit the red subscribe button to the right of your screen and welcome aboard. Folks, what is it that fascinates me so much about this place, about New York and its history? People ask me that, and, and lately I've been asking myself that a lot because I, I've suddenly found myself sort of devoting the last several years of my life to researching, writing, and recording this podcast, which is sort of two-tiered, whereby we look at the long history going back about 400 years or so, and then we look at the more recent history uh, of the people who are still with us, uh, who've been around a little bit. And I mean, on this show, the more you've been around and the longer you've been in and around New York, the better. After all, this is about history, right? Of this incredible place that we now call New York. And now, as I've said many times, the characters define that history. And, and the more I study it, the more evident that becomes. And that's going all the way back, all the way back to Henry Hudson and to his cynical ancient man of the sea, Robert Jewett, and their ill-fated young officer, John Coleman, and on through Adrian Block and the Algonquins by whom he was quite well revered and well regarded and on through Peter Stuyvesant and on through the English who stole it from him in 1664 and on through my very own uncle, Honest John Kelly, who was born just on the edge of five points back in 1822, who happened to be the man who was handpicked to clean up Tammany Hall as soon as they were able to actually get Boss Tweed's fat ass behind a jail cell, which was on Ludlow Street, by the way. And what I keep seeing, century after century, decade after decade, is that you never really know what exactly you're going to get on this incredible island. But usually, it comes with some gusto. And I think what keeps me passionate about this project, about this history, about these characters who have and who continue to define this history, is the remarkable mosaic that this place has been for about 400 years now. I'm passionate about it because the, the more I learn about it, the more fascinating it becomes, all of it. The way freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience were the focal points of the cultivation and development of this place as a society. That's very motivating to me because it started here in the city that we now call New York at a time when no one else on earth would allow it. Of course, th there were two cities in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century, Amsterdam and Leiden, that were unusually open to those ideals. But the overall structure of 17th century Europe made it all turn into a bit of a dead end, no matter where you were coming from. And if you had the audacity to want to think for yourself, to truly think for yourself and waver at all from the powers that be, well, ultimately you were going to have a problem. Because when the Manhattan Pilgrims came here, yes, there were Manhattan Pilgrims you just never really hear about them. And now the Manhattan Pilgrims, they not only knew the Mayflower Pilgrims up in New England, but they were actually really good friends with them because they all lived in Leiden together in the Dutch Republic before they sailed here. But now the Manhattan Pilgrims didn't speak English. They spoke French. I mean, of course they did. <laughs> this is the coolest city on earth. Of course our pilgrims spoke French. And while our guest today is not a Manhattan pilgrim nor a Walloon, I don't think. What she is, is a lady who not only maintains a freedom of conscience, but someone who has cultivated a manner of communicating with people over a variety of communication formats a variety of media in a way that not a lot of people ever do. And, and that may stem from the fact that her father's profession was 
teaching and developing communication skills. And it also may be partly affected by this island itself. In her work and in her art and in the way that she approaches her life and the way that she sees it through a lens that is quite unique to any other. Because I can say with complete confidence and utter delight that there is no one quite like this young lady. No one that I've ever met. And in spite of my rather extensive introduction here, um, you will soon see that no introduction could be too ornate for the complex mind of this guest, whom I am now extremely honored to introduce you to once and for all, Damas and Aaron, Madame and Monsieur, Damas y Caballeros, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to present my friend and very distant family member of sorts, singer, songwriter, writer, creator, and consummate communicator, Miss Suzy Roach. Welcome, Mavrao. Hello. Wow. That's a very uh, tough introduction to follow. <laughs> you don't have to follow it. You are it. <laughs> well, so, thank you. Welcome. How's things in New York City? Well, um, today it's a sunny day. It's very cold. And um, I guess all is uh, well, shall we say, considering the whole, you know, pandemic thing and everything. Yeah. And you're right down in the West Village. So you're right in, right in the thick of things. Yes. I, mm -hmm. And I've been here for the last... Uh, he, uh, God, almost 50 years. Wow. Wow. Tell me what it was like 50 years ago. <laughs> um, it was, it was kind of scrappy and seedy, you know, which is sort of the way I would, uh, describe myself too, you know, um, uh, it just, it was a rough and tumble back then and it it is now too except for i think there's probably a lot more wealth here now and uh you know so a lot of the old neighborhoods are just very very a lot of a very uh, wealthy people mixed in with people uh, like me who have kind of burrowed into our little apartments right which is what keep, gives it it it's 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 fabric that that lasts it's lasting fabric in new york is this mix of of so many di different types of people, different uh, demographics and, and, and income levels and, and uh, you know, ethnic backgrounds. I mean, that is, I think, what, what is one of the many things that's so amazing about New York. Um, you know, I, it's funny because I've, I've known you a, a while now, right? And, and, and I've seen you perform for a long time. Um, and you're very close with a lot of people that are very close to me, that I'm very close with. Um, but, and we even have some parallels in our careers. We've, we've been in some similar uh, businesses. But in looking a little bit deeper, Suzy Roach, I, I got to say, I'm fairly fascinated with you. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I think I'm blushing. <laughs> well, that's okay. You, you people said about you when you came to the Roaches that you added that 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 intangible, that je ne sais quoi, that extra something that that really elevated the group as a whole, as a whole, um, as a trio, because you because you you came into what your sisters had established as a duo, Maggie and Terry. Um, tell me, tell me what, what, what drew you into this profession of singing, songwriting, performing in the first place? Um, I guess it was just something that was very valued in my household. And, um, my father, uh, used to take me to the mall we grew up in New Jersey in a, a suburban town and and we my mother would go shopping and he he would take me over to where they were selling wigs and he would put different wigs on me and I would I guess 
behave differently depending on the wig or something. Anyway, he, he used to tell me, oh, you're going to be an actress. And, you know, I think that stuck in my mind. And I wish I could say it was more um, profound than that, but that, that's one of the, that's just popped into my head as it, one of the things, you know, that, uh, and of course, my father used to write songs for us and make us get up and perform them for relatives and things, but I was just so terribly shy. I could not do it and I would start crying. And um, so it's not like it was a natural thing for me to do, but, I did learn through the years that it was a way to be completely anonymous being on stage, which is kind of counterintuitive, you know, and I wonder if you, you would relate to this at all. You know, you're, you're basically playing a character when you're on stage, which is a form that is allowing you to be seen, you know, especially if you're a shy person. It's, it's painful in regular life to be seen. And uh, so when you're on stage, you're in service to something that's greater than yourself. And it's a little bit like being, you know, I would imagine being in the circus and being on a tight wire. You know, you're, you have to be right in the moment and it's a life or death kind of situation. Um, but it's, it is a, a way of being anonymous too which is another thing I love about New York City. As a person who's traveled all over the world and had to be on stage and have a lot of, you know, attention focused on me, but not really me, you know. Um, when I come to New York, when I've always come home to New York, I'm one of, you know, millions of people. And um, I just kind of fade into the scenery. I always love that about New York. Yes. I, I, anybody can blend in, anybody. And, and I always like that. Yes, and, and weirdly too, and this is always a, a shocking thing, a lot of people who come to New York, some people from different you know, continents come to New York and they run into somebody that they know. Yeah. And that's also happening. So, or you start to talk to strangers. And even though New York has kind of a, a bad rap of that people aren't friendly. I don't, I don't find that at all. I think that's very uh, untrue. I think it's a, it's a great misconception much as it is in a place like Paris, France, where I was only there once, but I was assuming they were complete jerks. Everybody, <laughs> these French people, they're rude that I, it couldn't have been more the opposite for me. And I think it's all a matter of how you talk to people. You know, if you speak, respectfully to anybody i think you're most people are going to be friendly wherever you are well it's odd because i've actually spent a lot of time in in um, paris and france oddly i don't speak french even though i've tried to learn i just had a, a nervous problem of uh, not being able to uh to uh you know get the nerve to pr to pronounce the uh, words but i look french so everybody on the street it comes up to me, and I, I don't even know what to say. You know, and they ask me right questions. In. But so I have, uh, even though, and Roach is a French name. It's also an Irish name, but it, it comes originally from France. So maybe I am related to those original uh, pilgrims of New York. Maybe you are. Okay. Maybe you are part Walloon, but they were Belgian. Ah, okay. Or they spoke French. Yeah. Um, did I have it right? What, your father was a, a teacher of uh, English language to non-English speaking people, correct? That was one of the things he did. He, he was a, um, also a lover of New York City and he would teach people in underserved communities how to right. communicate you know, to try to interview for a job or um, one of the other things I really remember about him was going to schools where he would teach um, mostly African-American kids. Um, he had a reading program and he would teach, you know, do one-on-one -on -one tutorials. And sometimes I would go and be like his assistant. And it, it was just the most beautiful thing, you know, because a lot of these, um, 
schools and children, no one really cared about them, you know, and they would just come alive. So yes, he was, uh, he was a communicator and he, um, you know, was very interested in people who, who were having a hard time, you know, getting by in the society. There's definitely something in, in, ingrained in you about the value of reaching other people and communicating effectively with other people. I, I really think that's where it came from originally. If, if you have, if, you know, taking a look at your overall history and then following your older sisters into this singing, songwriting, performing world seems like a logical next step. W were you more interested in just doing what they were doing or was it the communication with the audiences or did you have a real interest in music at that point? You were 20 or so. You were yeah, a young well, guy. I, I, I went to acting school, you know, um, and I was on, on fire. I was a young, you know, sassy person, hard to believe now, <laughs> but uh, I loved my family deeply and they, they had kind of run into a brick wall that, a little bit. Um, and I came in to New York and I was like, let's just do this thing. And we started pl uh, singing on the streets and we started singing Christmas carols. That's really how we got started. And then after Christmas, um, actually somebody saw us on the street and asked if we wanted to, <laughs> this is true, um, sing, do a tour of Ireland, standing in uh, uh, clothing store windows and singing. That was one of the <laughs> first gigs we were offered and we actually <laughs> Uh, said yes. Excellent. And they canceled it. At the no. <laughs> oh no! You didn't get to do it. We didn't get to. Oh do it. God! That would have been awesome. <laughs> so you, now your sisters, before you joined up with the group, I believe they did some backup singing for Paul Simon, correct? Yeah, that's right. They had taken a, a song or kind of crashed a songwriting class that Paul was teaching in New York City at I think NYU. Or Columbia, one of the one of those two, and um, they just kind of showed up and you know said we're we think we're great and and he he developed a, a relationship with them and they uh, did sing on there goes Ryman Simon that record and uh, they um, he helped them you know to sort of get uh, to make their first record which was called Seductive Reasoning. But, you know, they were very, um, again, spunky, scrappy, and, uh, you know, the Roaches, uh, the three of us, we, we didn't really fit into the mold of, of what girl singers were supposed to be. Um, we dressed the way we wanted, we didn't have a backup band of, of guys, and so um, we kind of did uh, run into some uh, resistance, shall we say. Well. You were doing something right because apparently Paul Simon recommended you gals to appear on Saturday Night Live at least once. Ladies and I think and you were there twice. The <laughs> What, what happened was that um, we created a stir down here in the village. We, we were playing in these little clubs and people were coming uh, to see us, like packing in after um, many, uh, you know, many years where nobody was going to those clubs. It was kind of 10 years after Bob Dylan and those people were there. And so we were getting all this attention for what we were actually doing. And um, I think the rest of the business type people were saying, okay, well, these people seem to be uh, doing something. So um, that was good. The only problem was that it didn't sound like what was on the radio and it was hard 
when we bumped up against the hard realities of the commercial uh, record business? Well, some people really appreciated that about you. One writer had written about hearing you in the 80s, the roaches, like Elvis Costello, The Clash, Patti Smith, and others, showed me that while the 60s would never happen again, there was still a possibility for something new and original and exciting to come along. wonderful listeners, fans, if you want to use that word, but they saw what we were doing. They felt what we were doing. And we were fearless. I mean, I must say, when I look back, I'm like, oh my God. And, uh, but yes, we were fearless and we were strong. And um, I think people appreciated that. A lot of it did have to do with starting out singing in the street too. You know, you had to sing loud and you had to be ready for anything. Um, I remember I actually went into labor when I was <laughs> pregnant with Lucy. Come on, on the really? Streets. And uh, right at that particular moment when I first got my first labor pain, we were singing Christmas carols um, and a some police officers walked up and tried to tell us to stop singing and because we had put out a you know a hat and uh, the people who had surrounded us to listen to us started yelling at the, the police and the police started you know it was a whole big scene and all of a sudden i doubled over in pain. oh my god that is fabulous so, where where was it it was up and um, we used to go up to the uh, upper uh, you know, like Midtown, where all the office buildings were, because people would be having office parties. Right. And they right. would say, hey, we'll give you 20 bucks if you come up and, uh, you know, sing at our office party. And is, is that what the going rate was, 20 bucks? What? Was the going rate 20 bucks? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we would do anything, anything for a buck, almost. That's amazing. That is amazing. Um, so, when when you were playing back then, tell me about some of the places in the early days of the Roaches. Once you joined your sisters and you were besides the street corners and Midtown, tell me some of the venues that you were playing back then. Well, in New York, we we mostly played uh, at Folk City, um, where the the guy who owned it, Mike Porco, uh, wanted to advertise us as girls, girls, girls. <laughs> And we, we had to for put my wash on that. And, <laughs> no, you can't do this. And like that. And then we would go, we would play at Folk City. Uh, the first time we played there. Was that in the village? Where's Folk City? Yeah, it's on third, it was on third street. Right, and okay. it, was the, it was the sort of, you know, the, the place where Bob Dylan and, and Dave Van Ronk and all, all those guys had come through. And it was a booming place in, in the, 60s but then by the time we got there it was kind of like this wasteland dark oh. dreary, and and people no one would go in there except for the other people who you know were playing and they were mostly guys you know with dark brooding hats and things like that um but anyway uh so we would play there and and the first time we played there mike would make you you would have to play seven uh nights a week three sets a night what? And he got 50 bucks at the end of the week. <laughs> that is the, you know, that's what we were dealing with. And then there was another place um, that was on Bleecker Street called Kenny's Castaways. Oh, well, I played there. You did? Yeah, I remember Kenny's Castaways. I played really? there a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was oh. a, I was a drummer in a band for a while. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. What was the name of the band? Uh, the Hemlocks. We were we played soul and R and B, believe it or not, three tall white guys that you wouldn't expect to. But 
it was fun. I just realized in a short time that I was not a really good drummer. <laughs> I was enthusiastic, <laughs> but I just wasn't that good. But even to, to get in a band is pretty yeah. good. I mean, geez, the drums are not easy. But fun. anyway, if you played there, you remember that you have to go back behind the bar, down the stairs into like the dreary. The, into a closet, basically. Yes. And you got to be in there with three other bands waiting to go. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Pat Kenny had this thing. He was the owner of it. And, yeah, and I know. Thing, do you remember the thing behind the bar? It was like this big horn made out of like deer skin or something. And he would bring it down and pour some sort of alcohol in it and pass it around the bar, like on special <laughs> occasions and people would, you know, I mean, it, it was it was kind of a crazy time. Like Viking style. Exactly. Right. <laughs> well, I also saw you at the bottom line. God rest that place, I miss it. I don't miss the food, but I miss the music. I know, um, it, was, it was a great club and we sort of graduated into the bottom line that was the big time right concept. right and they it you know we had a long long relationship with the bottom line and the sound was great and it was uh you know it, it was just a i think a lot of people still remember those shows not from just the roaches but from so many people all of them i remember seeing you once i think it was one of your christmas shows and uh um David Johansson came bouncing up on stage. Is that you, Santa Claus? A gifts I'm preparing for some Christmas sharing, but I pause because. And I, I had run into him once in a, in a music studio, in a recording building recording studio i mean a rehearsal not recording and he, that guy's like from another planet <laughs> did you know him pretty well i didn't know him very well but um i you know obviously i knew who he was enough to ask him to be in the show yeah i mean he was great but he was like on another he was like a whirling dervish he, he was like a ball of energy right i mean there the you know, he again, he was a real New York institution, and and we were sort of, we were kind of the folk, uh, you know, there was something, you know, the punk era was right. on, on right. the Lower East Side and CBGBs, and then we were the folk punk people, I guess, yeah. that's what people were calling what we were doing over in, in the West Village. But I, I think it wasn't necessarily as cool, you know, as the, the punk people. They thought they were <laughs> cooler than us. I, I thought the whole thing was cool. And the people I brought to that show were blown away that I actually knew the Roaches. They, that, that made me super cool in their eyes. So, um, yeah, well, we, the, the whole Christmas show, um, came about because I had been reading about Mother Teresa and I wrote to her and asked her if I could do a benefit for her, um, you know, for her charity. And uh, she never wrote back. I, and then my father and I went up to the Coalition for the Homeless uh, and we had a meeting with the guy oh, now i'm gonna cry when i think about this my, my father um he we went and we asked them if we could do a benefit for the coalition for the homeless and they said sure you know and so i went to alan pepper and i said can we do this christmas show this this was way before people were doing christmas shows i mean right. it was just an idea and actually the first one maggie and terry were skeptical of they didn't even want to use the name the roaches they, they so the very first christmas show was called suzzy roach really christmas show yeah because they were afraid it wasn't gonna work but we established it as a benefit and that was a great thing to be able to do every year you know is to, to do a christmas show that was a benefit and um we asked people uh, aside from doing just the traditional Christmas carols, we did, uh, we asked people to write a song about Christmas. So there's a whole bunch of songs that people wrote um, 
from those Christmas shows, which was great. And it was also back before there was a real resistance to Christmas. So it was again a different time. to get into any kind of political discussion but why would there be any resistance to christmas on any level and i'm just asking it oh, oh I, I, you know theoretically it's just it's such a beautiful time and there's such beautiful music it's just such a beautiful thing to do a show about well you know why would there be any resistance well i think i think probably uh, there's a million different reasons i mean for us we grew up with that music right. and you know, with the old, um, the story of Christmas and all that, it was very deeply, you know, we were Irish Catholic, like I think you you guys can, yes. you know, uh, relate to this, you know, the Christmas tree and the little story about Christmas and everything. And I think what, for a lot of people, they missed that part of it and it just became like a commercial, you know, selling things and buying things and all that. I. Other than that, I don't know what the reason is, you know, um, but th times change. And I, I think a lot of people are still into Christmas, but um, a lot of people, I think it's a painful time too, so. Well, it always kind of struck me because, you know, I was, I was going to your shows when that, you know, anti-Christmas or whatever sentiment sort of started to seep into society. And I always kind of noticed, I was like, well, these, these guys are, and gals are all really cool, you know, successful, notable musicians, yet they're doing a Christmas show. That's so cool and so refreshing. And, and it always, I always admired that about you and Loudy and the whole group of you guys. Awesome. And in fact, I wanted to ask you, because you clearly, I, you know, I wouldn't call you a 
to, you know, I don't know your religion, your spirituality exactly, but you don't shy away from Christianity, which I'm glad to hear and to see. And you don't seem to shy away from the Bible very much. Not that you're out there doing fire and brimstone on the sidewalk, but what, what what's your relationship with, what was your relationship with learning the Bible growing up and how has it affected your life? And that's not a religious question. I'm just curious because I hear it seep into your 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 work from time to time. Well, you know, it's it's really a great question for me because I, you know, I have a real fascination with uh, people who have the 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 topic of believing. I, I really am very fascinated by the traditions, the many different tr traditions that people have. Um, one of, you know, I grew up as, a, you know, as a kid, as a Catholic, and, you know, we were in church and all, a lot of music that I don't think I would have gotten into music without uh, the choirs and all of that. Um, it became more difficult for me as I got older to sort of buy into, you know, uh, any kind of church, but I am very interested in the idea of of belief, and and which I did a project called Zero Church, actually, that is a collection of um, me and, and my sister Maggie. We went up up uh, at Harvard, actually, um, and we went around and asked people about what they thought was a prayer. It could be anything. They just had to have a, a reason to think it was a prayer. And what I discovered up there was that this was a serious subject for many, many people. And um, we made a beautiful record called Zero Church, a base where we took all of these little prayers. Some of them were, you know, had they didn't have song structure at all, but we made an entire record uh, of these prayers. And it, it's very meaningful. However, when we, some people just love that record and it has given them a lot of comfort and they just love it. It is, if I do say so myself, it's a beautiful recording. in the music business did not want to even acknowledge that it existed. And so I think, you know, that's that's one of the issues about, um, you know, spirituality or religion or whatever. It's a very, it can be a very divisive subject. However, I'm very interested in it. And actually, I, I wrote two novels, um, and both of them, when I actually started writing, all of this stuff about growing up Catholic came pouring out of me, which I didn't even think, you know, I, I was surprised by. Well, I, I think it's, I, I really welcome it. And not because I'm a, you know, traditionally religious person. I, I'm not. I'm not someone that someone would look at and be like, oh, he's religious. But I happen to love the Bible, be, be, not because I'm deeply devout, uh, specifically, I, I am a Christian, but I, sort of a non-traditional one. I, I love the Bible because I love the text of it. I love what it represents, and I love the positive messages in it. That's it. I don't, I don't get down on everything needs to be the bi biblical, and everything needs to apply to it. And I don't think you're you're really supposed to take it all literally. I know you're not, um, and that's what that that seeps into fundamentalism. But I think there, the Bible is the most undervalued text in our society today well, there, there's so many stories in oh. in the bible and that's the thing if you like stories it, it makes a lot of sense uh to be interested in that um you know the, and then i know the on the other hand there are a lot of people who have been injured deeply by 
uh, you know, religious institutions, so they they just their mind gets closed off to the whole idea, and I understand that too. I, but I am, you know, there's so many different angles to look at it, and in a way, I wish I had uh, studied uh, religions of the world more, because I. Even though there has been a lot of bloodshed in the name of religion, there's also many stories, and I think maybe that's where um, you're leading with your uh, thing about the Bible. Is that there's so much imagery in there? Well, the, the the thing that made me start rethinking the Bible is my study of this this history of New of New York, and I mean going back to the early settlers and the Manhattan Pilgrims. They use the Bible as a guidebook. And, and what I think people misinterpret is they're not using it as a, as a religious text specifically. They are using it as a guidebook, keeping them on track. And they, they are told to, to adhere to the tenets of the Bible in, in their dealings with Euro, Europeans as well as people from, from other places, namely North America. And it's just a way to center these people in when they're going off into the unknown parts of the world, in parts uh, into societies that are completely unknown and untethered to what they know back home. And and it's just I've been rethinking it, and because it's it's written into the history books, this tenet of the Bible and this concept of the Bible is applied to this and applied to that. And it, you, it takes on a different meaning, I think, because it's more about structure than anything. It's not about religion. And I'm the only problem with it is, is just that it works when everyone fits into that certain, you know, that, those sets of rules. But when people start to impose it on other people in, in their own interpretation, he, the, one of the problems is that so many of the problems that arise out of these things have to do with people abusing it and uh, you know and and hurting other people with it i mean you know that that's it, there's been so many wars over you know the bible and stuff but yes i think what you're saying for many people it it gives a clear path of how to, how to behave you know and um, whatever works you know uh, for people I'm all for, but I'm mostly, I'm just curious. Uh, when you talk to somebody who has a real deep faith in something, anything really, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's compelling. And it's, uh, and you want to know what it is, you know? And I think as, as long as we respect everybody's right to, to adhere to a religion and, and that religion doesn't hurt other sects or religions, that's a great thing. And I, I think that's largely how we live in New York. You know, you, you respect everybody. Um, so I got out of New York recently and I went to Hanslew, Pennsylvania. And I was spending some time there. And I have some questions. <laughs> Can we talk about Hanslew a little bit? Hanslew, Pennsylvania is, is a fictional town from my novel called The Town Crazy. And uh, it takes place over the course of a year. And it is a Catholic, uh, you know, town. In, in some ways, it, that novel is extremely autobiographical for me personally, even though none of it is true. You know, that, that's one of the weird things about writing fiction is that you're creating or the creation is coming through you of a whole bunch of people who who aren't even real and okay. yet they become absolutely real to you where the hell did they come from you know chance i don't know i mean other writers probably could answer that better i wish i knew but it's like something that just happens to you and you're you're literally trying to keep up with it after a while you you these people are taking over your life your life you know they come into your life and you're walking around the streets and you're just they're doing things in your head and you you can't keep up with it to write it but 
Okay, Sister A, for instance. Yeah. Where'd she come from? She had to come from somewhere. I mean, I, listen, I got a lot of aunts who were nuns. Many, many. I know. Um, some of which you know. Uh, that's a very specific story. Well, I, as a child, I, I really wanted to be a nun and, and came quite close to going into a novitiate. Really? Yes. And I spent a lot of time at the convent in my town. So Sister A, Sister Annunciata is her name, um, she is not no one that I ever met mm -hmm. anywhere, but she's some, she, she must be, there's something about her that's very true and meaningful to me, um, but she doesn't, it's not like I knew somebody like her. I loved her personality I, because I have several great aunts and aunts who were who were nuns. And what what I think you you took a whole convent of nuns, <laughs> <laughs> which most people be like, what? And it was so full of personality and personal quirks and life and ideas and good spirit. Basically, when they rallied to me. <laughs> to make the devil costume for the kid. <laughs> it was the greatest scene. It was so, it was so true too. It wasn't like contrived. You could see it because I know nuns. I know what they're like. They're committed is what they are. Yeah, well they, I mean, actually I'm just reading, um, I'm on a, a, a jag of reading Alice McDermott novels and she, she has one that I just finished that's all about nuns. And the thing about nuns is that they have been made into caricatures over the years, you know, because a lot of people don't have the experience of actually being in a convent and seeing what happens. But there, there are these communities of women within these communities, they have a lot of power, except for that the male hierarchy of the church is still, you know, very much ruling what they can do. Um, However, they are just amazing. Uh, I mean, I, my early childhood experiences of nuns were, I mean, as kids, I don't know if you had this growing up, but nuns and priests were, you know, you just adored them and they were to be respected at all, you know, um, at all costs. And uh, I just loved the nuns, you know, I don't know how to say, well, you know, and some of them were, you know, really mean and some of them were just lovely and, you know, but they were just so mysterious in their, you know, habits and everything. But you captured like some truth to the personality of, 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 of many of them so well in such a unique and believable way. I mean, you really feel like, I, I felt like I could smell the convent, like, the, the, the wood on the floor and the beds and the and the the dinner and 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 the, the, the I felt like I knew I felt like I was there I felt like I was in the convent oh, when there was that, that really is so great to hear I it, because I really you know I do feel like that that book shows a, a slice of life that no longer really exists you know and yet it it is something that happened the blend of comedy and tragedy that you lay out it, it, interwoven throughout that book is incredible. Um, it, it's amazing. It's one of the best novels I've ever read. Really? I thought that that's I, so nice. I, I thank you. Thank I read you it. Reading it you know? I read it and I, st I went back to page one and read it again because mm -hmm. there were things in it. I'm like, wait a minute. What? what? <laughs> did, did I, imagine that or did that happen and they all happened i just had to go back and make sure <laughs> and what's up with sneedler sneedler is the uh imaginary friend yeah uh you know i did have an imaginary friend when i was a little kid um so that there is some some truth of that however my imaginary friend was not at anything like sneedler um Sneedler has a whole 
different thing, and I don't know where that came from. But uh, I did have my own imaginary friend. I, you know, again, I think I was just a very shy, kind of lonely child, and having an imaginary friend was a good thing. Well, I, I was blown away by the the the, the novel because I, I you. You do a lot of different things, says, but I, I mean, I guess you, you wrote one other novel that I haven't read, correct? You have two, yes. two novels? Yes. And a children's book. Yes. And Sneedler appears in that one, too. <laughs> um, but for somebody who hasn't written a lot of novels, you, you're, you're a phenomenal novel writer. Oh, thank you. I, I wish I had an idea for another one because it, it's such a wonderful um gift to have a novel running through your blood it it just uh like i said it it gives it it's so magical the way that the the characters just play in your head it it's really it's really something else i mean I, a lot of novelists say that they plan out their novels you know before they write them but I, my, both of my novels were not like that. I simply started writing and they just, <laughs> you know, led me somewhere. Yeah, I, I, I heard you say that somewhere then, and you just sort of dive in and you just lose yourself in it. And it just sort of, the light, it sort of takes a life. Yes, but in, in some ways, I like the, the pandemic would be perfect perfect to write a, a novel during because you know I, I both of my novels I don't think I got out of my pajamas once while I was writing them you just can't do anything else but the problem is you have to be visited by the great novel god who gives you an idea and then lets all these characters come into your head well um, you tapped into a neighborhood there that is just it's not like I want to go there but <laughs> I feel like I've spent a lot of time there and there's some very nice people there. I mean, there's some kind of people you want to steer clear of. But uh, <laughs> wow, I commend you on that, Susan. That's incredible. Um, we didn't even get to talk too much about Lucy, but tell me, tell me, you had mentioned a few dates that are upcoming soon. And, you know, we're actually back in the world and playing live, live gigs and stuff. So tell us what's coming up. You have something in Jersey and then something in Pennsylvania and then back in the city. That's right. We're we're going to be playing. Well, Lucy is my daughter, and she we actually have have been singing together for a couple of years, which is something I never thought would happen. But um, our gigs, yeah, they're starting up again. And um, one of them, the first one, is uh, Montclair, New Jersey, Outpost in the Burbs, and I think that's on March 18th. And then yeah. there's one on in Kennett. Something Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Sounds kind of cool. It's called Kennett's Flash or something like that. Yeah, and that, that's been rescheduled a couple of times. Okay. All, all of these have. And the Symphony Space one, is that's in New York City, and that's going to be fun because it's with the uh, novelist Meg Wallitzer. You're at Symphony Space on the 22nd of March, I believe, with Lucy. And I haven't been there. I'd, I'd like, I'm going to try to get there. That yeah, sounds like a lot of fun. That's, um, they've rescheduled that three times. Yeah, I believe it. I, I know how it is. I got a kid in middle school, so oh, I, I know about rescheduling. Well, you, you <laughs> parents of kids in school, you deserve a medal. You it's really been do. tricky. It's been tricky. Yeah. Well, Suzy Roach, you know, I, I am really into New York history, and I think history is cool, and I think it has a lot to do with people like you being a pivotal component of the history of this incredible place. And I got to tell you, I think you're, you very much define what has always amazed me and fascinated me about this place and about this city. You're as unique and interesting a person as anyone I've ever met. And your interest and your pursuits and views are as New York as anything. And I, I just thank you so much for taking the time to come on and, and talk with me and tell me some of your story. It's really amazing. It's really on, an honor to be able to do this with you. Well, thanks for having me, Chance, and it's been delightful. Same. Thank you so much, and I, I hope to see you March 22nd. Okay, great. Okay. Be Bye. well. Bye-bye.
I can see.